Welcome to Muslims and Mental Health with Sister Heather, a groundbreaking program looking at mental health issues through the biopsychosocial spiritual paradigm. Welcome to another episode of Muslims and Mental Health. Today we're looking at why sleep is important, and I'm going to be joined today by Dr. Faisal Qazi. Just to give you a little bit of information about why sleep is important, the National Sleep Foundation recently published that 40 million Americans suffer from 70 different types of sleep disorders, and 60% of adults report having sleep problems a few nights a week or more. In addition, as we look at the biopsychosocial uh, spiritual paradigm, we note that in the Islamic tradition, sleep has been discussed for 1400 years, and many of the discoveries over those 14 years have only been realized by the psychological profession in the last 100 to 150 years. So there's a lot to discuss in terms of the Islamic tradition and the value of sleep, sleep disorders, and all that encompasses that which has to do with sleep. So I would like to welcome today, and it's an honor to have him here with us, Dr. Faisal Qazi. He's a local neurologist to Southern California, and he's a co-founder of an organization called MINDS. It's a charitable healthcare and community development foundation, and he's, he has experience in treating sleep disorders. He has given seminars and published a review in sleep medicine. He also is a board a member of the Whitestone Foundation, which is a national community building initiative. Please uh, welcome with me, Dr. Faisal Qazi. Hello, Dr. Faisal Qazi. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to start today by asking you, why is sleep important to our health? That's a great question. It's both uh, philosophical and scientific. Sleep is, uh, is part of human physiology. It is a, an intricate part of our, our uh, what we call ultradian or circadian cycle, meaning sleep is restorative uh, to our brain and therefore it's necessary. Without it, brain malfunctions, our performance de declines, and sleep really essentially is key to maintaining our immunity, uh, our general physical well-being, and mental uh, health as well. Mm -hmm. And so, is with that being said, do you think there are any differences between the importance of sleep for both men and women? Or I mean, are there gender differences, or is it pretty much the same? There are some gender differences in terms of how men and women uh, get sleep, in terms of the amount of sleep they get, um, how it affects their health, physical health. Um, there's some minute differences. Uh, just to give you an example, sleep is, is something that also helps us maintain our immunity, immune levels. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're sleep deprived, you tend to get sicker more often. Your immune, your inflammatory markers or inflammatory uh, chemicals in your body are at a higher level. The stress hormones are at much higher level. Um, if you compare men and women, uh, women tend to develop more cardiovascular disease uh, if they are more sleep deprived as compared to men, disproportionately more. Even though everybody is, is, is affected by, uh, by sleep deprivation, I mean, women tend to be slightly more affected uh, than men. Um, women also tend to, some of the newer data suggests that women also tend to require more sleep. Not by much, some of the studies have demonstrated um, up to 20 minutes more a night, but cumulatively that amount adds up. So there are differences in men and women's health requ sleep requirements, sleep requirements that pertain to their health. Um, but in general, sleep is, is, is really essential, or good sleep, or you know, everybody attempts to sleep, uh, but good sleep is, is key to to physical uh, functioning and well-being. So does that vary by age or, I mean, do you have um, examples of like what uh, the number of hours that one would need to sleep in terms of age or uh, gender or, 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 or is there a difference? Yeah, most definitely. So yeah, the, the, the um, research is very clear on, on how sleep uh, changes in terms of duration and stages um, over, over the years. So from uh, from infancy um, to um, uh, to early childhood to adolescence, where infants require much longer duration of sleep, up to f more than 14 hours or 16 hours. Then by the time you get to adolescent years, still at least nine to 10 hours are required by, by adolescents. Well, as you get older, on average, um, an average, an average individual um, 
necessarily needs about eight hours of sleep. That could have genetic variation, but eight hours of sleep is considered um, the standard in, in terms of ma maintaining your physical well-being and, and, and functioning. Um, you do, as you age though, as, as one ages, uh, an elderly you'll see sleep duration being less and less. Mm -hmm. But there are many factors uh, play a role in it. Um, um, timing of sleep changes um, in, in elderly, for example. Um, various elements in our in our in our um, in our disease in diseases that present, that are that are um, or diagnoses that people carry, such as back pain or restless leg syndrome, starts interfering with sleep patterns. So, so not only the sleep duration changes, but sleep can be quite disruptive as as one ages. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So is there a point at which sleep is too much? I mean, how much sleep is too much? And does that also have an effect? Most definitely. sleep, Excessive sleep, or what we call hypersomnia, um, uh, could have adverse effects. Uh, we, we, from research, we know that excessive amounts of sleep uh, can also lead to cardiovascular disease. In other words, placing, you more, placing one at more risk of Heart, heart attacks or strokes. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the, beyond the definition. We know the average eight hour uh, of requirement for adults. Excessive sleep also depends on a person's um, requirements, daily requirements, job requirements, and, 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 and impairment in function. So for example, mm -hmm. if somebody needs 10 hours of sleep uh, to be able to function effectively during the day, but that may be genetically set for them. That may not be considered mm -hmm. excessive, but if it's Coming in the way of, 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 of one's functioning, coming showing up to to, to work late despite mm -hmm. spending sufficient time in bed, uh, for example, being very sleepy during the daytime, which means most likely the night sleep was not uh, was not good quality. Um, those can constitute our category of hypersomnia. It does place one at risk for increased cardiovascular disease. In fact, um, it places one for greater proportion of cardiovascular disease than sleep deprivation itself. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that would have implications for people that worked like shift work as well. Um, and uh, is it harder for people who like work second and third shifts to get the appropriate amount of sleep? Shift work is definitely very disruptive to, to overall sleep, especially night shifts. Our circadian rhythm, which is, which is our biological clock that maintains sleep cycles, really is designed to, to react to light and dark. Mm -hmm. um, and so sleep hormones or, or chemicals in the brain that induce sleep tend to increase when, when there's darkness. So now shift work, which has been increasingly so in, in this country particularly, um, shift work allow, forces us to start changing those cycles. Um, it, so it becomes overall, overall disruptive to the sleep architecture. Mm -hmm. And thus we see a lot of sleep, uh, sleep uh, impairment problems in people who, do to, who tend to do shift works. Mm -hmm. um, in general, though, I think, you know, I, I, think pe I think people are just not getting enough sleep. Mm -hmm. Your statistics just mentioned that uh, chronic sleep deprivation is, uh, is, is suffered by uh, millions of Americans, mm -hmm. and I'm certain across the globe as well. But there are cultural differences in, in, in how different societies um, manage their workflow and climate or, I mean, temperature, weather, uh, weather patterns affect what people do. Um, but the fact that the reality is that even even if you take um, school children or high schoolers in, in the United States, um, only about 10% of them, or less than 10%, seem to be getting sufficient sleep, what we call it, between eight to nine hours. Mm -hmm. So they tend to be uh, they, they tend to be quite sleep deprived, which which could affect um, again performance. Uh, learning capability uh, and, um, and, and just really advancement as a result. I think that's a really good point that you bring up, especially about the teens uh, and for the parents who are watching because uh, it's an interesting time for them, right? Because they s suddenly require more sleep than they did when they were younger mm -hmm. and more sleep than even though people were older than them for, for that that time frame, right? Mm -hmm. And yet they're having a lot of homework to the point where they're going to sleep right. very late at night. So they're probably not getting enough sleep right. in general. Um, and it, it's interesting to note that I noticed in Minnesota, 
they actually shifted the school time, mm -hmm. the start time, to accommodate for this uh, sleep pattern. So they they start later in the day, like I think 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, to accommodate for them to get enough sleep. Um, so the average high schooler is pretty sleep deprived, but something to, for parents to keep in mind because mm -hmm. Uh, they really need to make sure their children are getting enough sleep. Right? Yeah, that's right. And and um, really, one of one of the functions of sleep is is really memory consolidation. In other words, things we do throughout the day consolidates at night. So if you are if you're a student and you're in your formative years and you're in in, in learning phase, uh, you really need that uh, sleep to uh, uh, to further enhance your performance going forward. Um, and parents do have to keep in mind that Minnesota example is a good example. There's a lot of conversations in and around, um, in and around school hours um, mm -hmm. as to what is what is more appropriate. But we're also realizing that that because sleep deprivation is such a crisis amongst young and old, but but particularly affecting young people, that um, uh, that other fact the other factors that may not necessarily have been there in the past that's also affecting besides the amount of immense amount of homework and so on and so forth, like such as devices and, and computers <laughs> yeah. and TV programming and uh -huh. all this hyper-stimulation that's in and around us, which is inescapable mm -hmm. these days. So that's a great segue into my next question, which is what causes the problems? You know, what are yeah. the root of these problems that we're seeing? So sleep problems is, is what I call multifactorial. It really depends on one's social circumstances and activities. We know that uh, in elderly, there I mentioned for various diagnoses, diseases, uh, aches and pains, arthritis, low back pain, for example, conditions like restless leg syndrome um, are, are constant interference mm -hmm. in sleep and really just not only disrupts the sleep architecture, but also disrupts sleep duration um, and, and sleep hours. Then you take more, more, more younger adults, um, the, you know, we live in we live in culture now where where there's um, late night coffee, all night restaurants. I mean, there's a lot, there's a little bit of a cultural shift in nighttime entertainment mm -hmm. that uh, that that for, that uh, allows people to uh, to really forcibly stay awake, despite mm -hmm. despite what the circadian rhythm or your uh, biological sleep clock is is indicating. Mm -hmm. So that shifts sleep patterns, uh, sleep patterns off, and in, in in children. Again, same applies to young adults. Devices in bed, computers, watching TV programs, snippets uh, on television, um, social media, be it be, um, uh, so on and so forth. There's a lot of distractions that uh, that take away from uh, from from sleep itself. Mm -hmm. um, that those are the key key leading factors that these days have really affected overall sleep deprivation. Some of the things that weren't there maybe even a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have this American saying, early to bed, early to rise. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, do you feel like that's a hard, fast rule that people should stick to? Or is it really adjustable? I, I personally think it's adjustable. The reason I say that is, um, uh, take, for example, somebody who's sleep deprived. And, and, and they've done these research studies where they have kept people awake. Um, They've kept people awake all night, mm -hmm. and then they've checked them, their stress hormones throughout the next day throughout, and stress hormones were elevated, meaning that that the body is trained, mm -hmm. that immunity will go down, and you're at risk for being. Uh, you, if this goes on long enough, one is at risk of getting sick, one is at risk of um, of um, of um, uh, of not being able to be vigilant enough to perform. Could you driving could be affected by that. But the studies have also shown that by just taking a 30-minute nap, those stress hormones reduce drastically. So you, mm. the, even a short amount of nap can actually help make up um, functioning through, mm. uh, through the day. So it could be, it could be argued that, um, that as long as some element of sleep is made up uh, the following day, that our functioning capabilities are, are restored. Mm. Um, I, I, I would say that if, if one's given a f truly full vigilance vigilance test um, that many people that are chronically sleep deprived, even in small amounts, by cutting an hour or two hours each in their nightly sleep, their vigilance level can will never compare to somebody who is well rested. And depending on depending on the level of work they're doing that involves a level of attention, that could affect uh, in, in neurosurgeons. Be has to be vigilant in a surgery room. It could affect performance. Mm -hmm. um, 
so depending on the, the level of acuity required, the attention required, and one's per, per functioning and performance. Um, but in general, sleep can be made up. It should be made up. Um, and sleep, chronic sleep deprivation is still not advisable because your biological clock should be maintained. Um, should be maintained a level well, well, well at least it's your your physical health is uh, is manageable. So I thought the point about naps was very interesting, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of wondering what you think about the cultural differences in terms of, you know, like how some cultures have siestas and, mm -hmm. you know, afternoon naps is just a part of the regular day. Um, do you think that sort of cultural structuring is more advantageous for the human body, or do you, you know, is um, does it matter that much? That's a that's a great question. Um, the siesta or the nap culture, which is very prevalent um, in, in, in parts of Europe and, and most of Asia and Middle East, is actually historically been just part of human condition. Mm -hmm. um, it really isn't within the last hundred years, but more within the last two hundred years that continuous long periods of night sleep, what we call nocturnal sleep, has really taken root as a, as a mainstay. But prior to that, uh, people used to have uh, used to have it was part of. It was just part of your pattern that there will be rest needed uh, in the middle of the day. Now, culture and 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 the temper and the climates and, and and regional geographical differences make a difference. You could be in the desert region in the Middle East where it is so hot that you can't continue to work throughout the day. You need a four-hour break in between where people take advantage of it and and, and go to sleep. Countries where there was there has been a siesta culture, like in Spain, you're noticing that the tourism is driving more and more restaurants to be open during the mid-afternoon hours. Mm -hmm. So, so less and less people may be may be take, taking advantage of a siesta that would otherwise be popular. Um, but I I, th I I do think nap um, has a value. It's hard to conceive in society like ours, which is very mm -hmm. industrial in Japan, for, particularly for example, um, where where. Uh, where naps are not um, not not necessarily accommodated, um, but I think naps do have a value. They they also they also research also suggests that um, nap duration makes a difference. If if naps are prolonged, um, then they can actually result in a decline in cardiovascular health. That can actually predispose one to heart attacks and hmm. uh, and and strokes. So naps are about 30 minutes to one hour, um, in my opinion, tend, is, is, is a healthy way to go. But that opportunity is not afforded to, to most people in, in industrial societies as such. Um, and that, um, that requires really sustained nighttime restful sleep, which is where our focus has been for most of our research. That's very interesting. At this time, I would like to take a break, a short break for our sponsor, and we'll be back shortly. Thank you. Welcome to Adelante. This is Adelante Recovery, and my name is Yvette Kuglin, and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4455. A lot of time we don't even know what's wrong with us and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So we're only a phone call away. Thank you. Welcome back to Muslims and Mental Health, and we're discussing again today why sleep is important with Dr. Faisal Qazi. I'd like to continue and ask you, um, what are some of the signs and symptoms that parents uh, can pay attention to for their children and teens that would alert them that there's a problem afoot? I mean, very clearly, if, if, if a child is just having difficulty paying attention in class or dozing off, which, which we see quite often, um, that indicates that the, the child does need more restful sleep the night before. Mm -hmm. um, I, very commonly, some children have a terribly difficult time getting up in, in time enough to get on the school bus. Um, that means their sleep hours have to be managed uh, managed better. Uh, performance difficulties, decline in classroom performance is an indicator of something, of especially if the decline is not rather abrupt or 
uh, if the decline or is substantial. In other words, a good, well-performing child all of a sudden is struggling uh, to, to maintain grades or just even exa test exams or quizzes time to time, mm -hmm. then one should look into that. But those are those are rather easily detectable things. But uh, focus on irritability, uh, food intake, all those things. Uh, food intake could decline if children are perpetually tired mm -hmm. um, and that affects their nutrition uh, and uh, physical health again. So that's great that you mentioned that because that's what I wanted to ask you next which is how this actually this lack of sleep and the sleep deprivation affects their health. Uh, what are the consequences to their health? Um, and I mean, mm -hmm. you know, to we can look at all the different ages. I mean, the children, the teens, the Adults, I mean, what are the different ways in which you, you I know you mentioned right. before some of the cardiovascular uh, strains, uh, but what other consequences are there? Sure, in, in terms of the cardiovascular health, that's uh, health problems, those are long term, mm -hmm. they don't occur overnight. Uh, so, that's that's part of the risk of chronic sleep deprivation. But really, in the short term, you'll you'll see uh, people getting sick more often, mm -hmm. um, either upper or upper respiratory, upper respiratory infection, but. Um, but getting sick more often is, is classic, obvious, easily noticeable, uh, and tangible uh, measure. And this goes um, back to what you were talking about with immunity, I guess, before, right? Immunity yeah. qu quite clearly declines um, when, when there's sleep deprivation. And there's really classic and some great uh, great work been done on this from, from various research centers. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a proven correlation. Uh, but my, my biggest concern remains is, is performance of, of, of people. So mm -hmm. you don't, you, 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 um, we live in a society that uh, that's so values uh, daytime functioning performance. We have uh, high intensity jobs, uh, you know, fo folks have to make deadlines. And the level of attention and concentration that's required um, really requires a lot of consolidation of information, a lot of absorption of, of, of material out there, memory, a very, you know, very, very um, uh, tangible memory, um, and all of those are really affected by sleep deprivation. And I've had patients that have come up and are unable to perform, meet their deadlines. Mm -hmm. I've had to recommend them that you know we, sh we after having assessed everything else uh, or other other conditions that we, sh we must look at your sleep pattern. So I ha I often have them do sleep diaries, mm -hmm. so I get a sense of how much time they're spending in bed how much time spent in bed is really spent sleeping. Mm -hmm. Are they tossing and turning? Are they having a difficult time falling asleep? Are they having a difficult time maintaining sleep? Those are all forms of insomnia. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the performance measures are really critical for most people and dear to most people. And, and, and there's a direct link to, to sleep deprivation in that. So when an individual is just thinking about themselves without the assistance of someone else in their life noticing, mm -hmm. um, what it sounds like you're describing are things like you would feel fogginess or mm -hmm. a lack of thought clarity. I mean, these, I think, were probably something they could recognize within themselves, right? Or Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Just fatigue, a lot of daytime fatigue and what we call excessive daytime sleepiness. Mm -hmm. Is a direct relation uh, has direct relations to the quality of sleep the night before, mm -hmm. and uh, that that has Im immense impact on the daytime performance of, of most people. So I'd like to look uh, a little bit more specifically at the Muslim community, um, and are there resources that exist that you know of, particularly in the Muslim community, to assist people who are concerned with sleep issues? Uh, frankly, I, there are no particular resources, but there are general resources available in sleep clinics mm -hmm. um, and 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 various sleep experts that can that can advise. Um, again, that you bring, would that you would consider Muslim friendly, like you know, quote Muslim friendly, because sometimes we have right. in our community stigma around getting services for lots of health issues, right. and uh, that where where a Muslim could go and feel comfortable, I right. guess, is what I'm trying to get to. And at, th at this point, unfortunately, I'm not particularly aware of any any programs. Mm -hmm. um, I think if, if if a sleep deprivation is an indicator of underlying depression or anxiety mm -hmm. disorders, which very commonly it is, mm -hmm. um, due to insomnia, then I think there are sufficient mental health resources uh, right now. You know, counseling centers, for example, within Southern California, mm -hmm. there are national initiatives um, by by organizations like American Health Professionals mm -hmm. um, that are that are involved in mental health education. And ad advocacy in my own organization, Minds, uh, that does uh, similar work in, in LA County. People, you know, if taken advantage of, of those services, uh, that can be one subset and factor. 
there are also um, besides the besides the illnesses that lead to what we call secondary um, uh, facets of sleep deprivation, there may be some cultural um, uh, and religious. Uh, practices that mm-hmm. could affect one's sleep, such as waking up very early for dawn prayer, which is Fajr Salat, um, that like, many people may not be able to fall asleep after uh, praying, or if they go to the mosques. You know, mosques are no longer very in close proximity for most people. They may have to drive 30 minutes, so they'll have to wake up 30 minutes or, or so beforehand. Mm-hmm. Um, so many many of those factors also are, are components of a cultural understanding of where Muslim, mm-hmm. Muslims are coming from. Ramadan, for example, the month of fasting, mm-hmm. um, despite the emphasis within the religious uh, sayings of the Prophet on, on adequate sleep, uh, almost everybody I know in, in the month of fasting is, is sleep deprived and terribly so, mm-hmm. um, more so than, than usually in, in, in rest, during the rest of the year. So we have to, we, we have to have some degree of understanding that there's ways to cope or make up um, uh, for those uh, sleep inadequacies mm-hmm. and still maintain one's spiritual uh, spiritual performances. So I, I love the idea always of coping ahead. Mm-hmm. So uh, when it comes to Ramadan, how would you suggest uh, people cope ahead? Take, for example, in month of fasting, there's a lot of emphasis, particularly in the last 10 nights, where people have stay up all night and, and do prayers. Mm-hmm. Um, even then, religious scholars will, 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 um, will advise and say uh, that um, designate at least the portions of the night for sleep. Mm-hmm. So even though it's, it's, it's what we call polyphasic sleep or a short burst of sleep, some sleep is necessary. I do advise that take that people who are going to stay up a portion of the night or all of the night to do to do ibadat or worship or prayers, that they must take advantage of a fine time to to take naps. I think those naps are are useful. In, in general, during fasting, we notice that. Overall, daytime sleepiness goes down. In other words, when 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 the, there's no there's no food in the stomach, one is going to have a generally difficult time falling asleep. Mm-hmm. So, d- d- daytime naps could be difficult for for some folks. Um, but if you haven't slept uh, during the night, uh, and if one could um, afford to do so, they should take advantage of, of, of restful periods, um, one or one nap at least of thirty minutes uh, or so. That can get a lot of people going, actually, uh, fun- functioning fairly well. Also, continuous uh, sleep deprivation over a period of, say, 10 nights um, is, is, is nearly impossible, but it's very deleterious to health. So, and uh, during the day um, or during the night, one f- must find time to take uh, naps. The interesting fact about polyphasic sleep, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of, as opposed to one continuous long period of night, nocturnal sleep or night sleep, polyphasic sleep uh, used to be actually what's what new data is showing, uh, new research is showing, used to be the norm. So okay. what human beings used to do is used to have. So when the sun goes down, there was no not living in a world of, world of electricity. You had people who had a really longer night period, mm. because after, for example, Isha prayer um, in the in the Muslim world, for example, most most people have pretty much from then till till dawn time. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of stimulation. There was no television to keep you awake, so uh, so people used to sleep in in, in polyphasic, uh, meaning a few hours here, then maybe some folks may get up for prayers, then a few hours there, and they used to get sufficient sleep. Um, there's nothing indicates that that resulted in sleep deprivation. So, hmm. so in, in principle, I, I I personally agree that polyphasic sleep or bursts of sleep uh, will allow uh, many people to be able to function. Mm-hmm. Um, yet, I think the in, our challenge in the society is that is that most people are working during the day mm-hmm. or in weekdays, and they may not have that opportunity to take a nap. So, they really have to modulate their um, uh, their sleep behavior very well. Otherwise, one of the reasons I think so many people get sick by the end of the month of Ramadan on fasting is because the immunity level is really mm-hmm. not just from fasting itself, but from the lack sleep of sleep. Sleep deprivation. Yeah, yeah that, well, that's really encouraging because to learn about this polyphasic uh, sleep because you read a lot of hadith mm-hmm. about sleep and how people were staying up all night praying and the Prophet would encourage them to get sleep, that their slumber was important and so right. forth. 
but this gives hope that people could actually do this and right. still get an adequate amount of sleep because that is always a question that came up for me as I was reading this. How are these people getting enough sleep when they're praying all the time? So that's really encouraging, actually, to I, I wasn't aware of that history. Um, so I'm, I'm sure it's going to be very uh, enlightening for a lot of people to hear that. Um, just to circle back for a second, when you're talking about the Minds uh, Foundation, mm -hmm. could you give just a little information about how people can look into Minds and find Minds? I mean, like the, what's the website? Sure. Well, um, the, clearly the easiest way to, 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 to um, connect is through the website, which is mindsnetwork.org, M-I-N-D-S, network, all one word, dot org. Um, and some of the services um, that, that we can avail to people in L.A. County, in, in Orange County, um, is, is uh, access to uh, therapists, counselors if needed. But a lot of education in and around mental health in, in general, both for those that are interested in certifying and, and various, uh, various certificates available for, if, you know, in our train the trainers program and, and those that are in need of, of, of help. Um, so we have resources that we can connect uh, individuals to um, based on the degree of need of uh, assistance. So website is the ideal way to go. There, we, there are phone numbers on the website uh, where uh, you can also reach the staff, um, our triage staff in the office. Um, that would be the best way. And just to mention, mine's also received an award, I believe, right? Uh, a national award, is that correct? We're, uh, um, we're fortunate enough to have received a number of awards of recognition, and um, including a nonprofit uh, of the year uh, by local congressional, local elected officials, um, and even in, in prior years, uh, an award from the State Department uh, mm -hmm. for for the services provided uh, to communities in need. At that time, we were also helping exchange students mm -hmm. uh, through their need and coping while they were here. So. Um, that's we're fortunate enough to, to have some of the work recognized. That's wonderful. Um, I just want to also point out another organization that Dr. Kazi mentioned was the American Muslim Health Professionals, which we've discussed in previous episodes. But just to remind you, it's amhp.org. Um, and they have also a database of different types of professionals, people like Dr. Kazi who are neurologists and psychotherapists. Um, a lot of different uh, medically trained uh, individuals. Uh, so that sort of concludes the questions I have about sleep. But as with all our interview mm -hmm. sessions, we like to ask people some fun questions. And so we're going to turn to those now. Um, and our first one is, who is your Muslim hero, if you have one, and why? <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, I, I cannot imagine there could be any answer that's not cliched for say, <laughs> but I would say that. <laughs> I would say that uh, you know this is this. Many people may not be aware of this. Um, there's a poet from uh, 18th, 19th century I India. Mm -hmm. His name is Ghalib, mm -hmm. and he's an interesting guy because I'm studying him now. And I, the reason I would consider him my Muslim hero, but he was very sacrilegious. Huh. And I hope this isn't. It doesn't reflect on my level of devotion, uh -huh. but but he he talked about he talked about his relationship to God, which was very strained in his poetry. And he talked about drinking alcohol in the, in the mosque, for example, and fought off critics in, during, through poetry. Uh -huh. And then the thing is, he had a lot of critics, and some people even called him a non-Muslim. But the, re the reason I appreciate that conversation that he and his critics had and his relationship to God is that nobody came and hurt him in any physical way. Mm. Not and, and, and the, the reason I'm so enamored by that is because for some reason I feel like in the Muslim world the, the chaos we see and the sometimes this extreme opinions people form and, and, the, and that results in violence mm -hmm. is that we have a long history, a cherished history of celebration of aesthetics mm -hmm. as a form of communication but the, no physical harm. I mean one had the liberty to do and say things when needed as long as that person is exploring his, his relationship. So I, I find them to be uh, a hero in a sense that he advanced uh, a, an image of, of Islam that was a peaceful religion with a civilized discourse and that all his the others around him, religious, semi-religious, secular Muslims at that time, really respected that. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I think he's a, he's a good person to study for our times. That's right. I, I, I like that. I mean, it highlights a great point about the civilized discourse, right. as you mentioned, because... 
Uh, what a lot of people may not know watching is that historically poetry itself was used mm -hmm. like a sword. It was, yeah. it was how people battled with each other and their ability to create uh, poetry was something, you know, amazing. Yeah. So I, I'm glad that you gave yeah. us that example and I hope people learn from it. Um, so continuing on, mm -hmm. uh, what is your favorite concept in Islam and why? Oh. Oh, uh, that, that's a very loaded question. I think Islam has such, so many beautiful concepts. You know, what I, I really cherish, and I'm, just because I'm thinking more and more about this lately, is, is that the way, the way that religion brings people together, there's this concept of khuwa, or brotherhood, mm -hmm. um, and it creates a sense of unity of purpose mm -hmm. amongst Muslims. And I think the way it brings people together in a communal way, uh, is really an incredible idea. I mean, and I think the parallels of which parallels for which are, I, 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 I would have to say, are not that prevalent. And and the reason I've been thinking more about it is because we're, we're increasingly living in a world that is so highly individualized. Mm -hmm. And it is it is I, I find in Islam that where while there is good amount of emphasis on individualism and your individual responsibility, but it also emphasizes our responsibility to each other. So I think that idea is really um, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And so what would your favorite word be and why? Oh, favorite word? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think favorite words uh, change. Um, <laughs> uh, as time goes on, I, I would have to say that lately I'm really enjoying the word terrible. Terrible. Uh, okay. and, the only reason, and the only reason that is is my three-year-old starts saying it. So every time we give him something <laughs> healthy to eat, like salad, the only thing he says is terrible. So that's become my favorite word to listen to these days. Oh, mashallah. That's great. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for you. honoring us with your knowledge and presence here today. Um, this concludes another episode of Muslims and Mental Health. And we do appreciate your concerns, your feedback, any questions you have future shows you would like to see us uh, have here on Muslims and Mental Health. And you can give us that commentary at nafshealertherapy at gmail.com. That's N-A-F-S-H-E-A-L-E-R therapy at gmail.com. Thank you.